Thank you, Christina. Thank you. And grazie mille, Christina, although I have to say you're Roman, I'm Milanese, so... <laughs> Nobody's perfect, Thank yes, you. Nobody's perfect, exactly. But it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you and to be here with a sympathetic audience that already knows the design is so much more than chairs. Kind of got fed up with chairs a long time ago. And, uh, uh, and it's been my pleasure and my mission to expand the idea of design for the MoMA audience, which is a very international audience, and for my, my peeps like you, my peeps, and to make everybody understand that design really is an endeavor that encompasses so much more than just physical objects. But of course, you already know that. On the other hand, when I got to MoMA, in 94, almost 18 years ago, I realized that coming from Italy, where design is much more taken as normal, I had to really work a lot to make people understand in the United States what design is. And it's interesting because that really has to do also with the idea of what's next. You know, the geography of design and how different countries and different communities perceive the idea of design. You know, in Italy, Italy used to really know what design was, but unfortunately it remained stuck in this idea of uh, chairs and furniture. And elsewhere instead, where minds are nimbler and where education systems are a little rough and maybe have to really fight for themselves and fend off for themselves. Instead, design is much more up to date. And that's really what I would like to discuss with you today throughout the presentation. I mean, during the presentation, I will talk about what I know, which is not truly my work, but just the examples of the exhibitions that I've done that express this kind of effort in pushing the idea of design further. But I would like you to really pay attention to where things come from and where they're going. Because today, Design is not anymore best in Italy or best in England or best in Japan. It truly is expanded all over the world, made free and set free by the fact that we're not tethered anymore as designers to industries and to production plants, but that instead we can really leap off in the virtual world or in the liminal world. Why call it virtual? It's the real world for us, in the liminal world. And truly, what makes for centers of gravity gravity in the new geography of design today are schools. So with this kind of lens, I would like to tell you a little bit more about what it entailed at the Museum of Modern Art to push this idea of design a little further. Now, it's a real luck to work at MoMA because you have truly a stage. There are many people, many colleagues around the world that are doing fantastic work, and you might not know about them just because I'm at MoMA and they are maybe in a museum in Frankfurt, which is definitely a polar center of the world, but not as much as New York. So my first luck was to be able to stand on that stage uh, a stage that gives you visibility and also authority. So the second, um, the second really important point with working at MoMA is the idea of the power that you get to actually push ideas and designers and thinkers forward. So with that in mind, one of the first shows that we did was about materials. This is 95, so a long time ago, but already at that time, materials were becoming much more about software than about hardware. I mean, it used to be 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, that in order to produce a prototype of a plastic chair, you had to invest $50,000 or something similar to get a mold made in either steel or aluminum and push at high temperature a slurry of plastic pellets and actually have something come out on the other side, which was not perfect yet. You had to kind of shave it off and, and polish it. And instead, already in 95, but even more so today, new technology and materials enables us to produce with resins, you know, catalyzed and resins at ambient temperature prototypes that are already viable, not to mention 3D printing, not to mention the simulations that you can do on the computer. In other words, the power to design materials is in the hands of designers today. It, they don't have any more to rely on chemists and engineers. So this kind of flexibility was a way to, once again, use beautiful objects because you still need to have the eye candy and the attractive 
a magnet of beauty in order to push ideas sometimes, but with that particular kind of slant. And that exhibition was followed by others, but I would like to point out to you just a few. Another exhibition that I'm particularly proud of, that once again talked about the connection that design has to real life, was WorkSphere's. WorkSphere's was in, was in 2001, but of course, the design of the show itself, the curation started before, and it started during the period of the dot-com boom. When people, because of a difference um, in age, in the age of the workforce, started experimenting with new modes of working that were much more socially based. You know, you can imagine what that implies in the design of an office coming out of a generation of cubicles that used to be revolutionary in the 50s when they were invented and then they became suffocating. So this whole exhibition was about a change not in style, not in lifestyle, but rather in behaviors that had a very strong impact impact in the way we live, and that had to do with design. So the second point was, design is about life, and designers are the ones that enable us to actually use whatever innovation, whatever progress is available to us in the most fulfilling way. Then came SAFE. SAFE Design Takes on Risk. That was an exhibition that happened that whose design, whose curation started in 1999 and 2000. And at that time it was called Emergency, and it was all about emergency equipment, it was all about um, fire, fire um, department equipment, it was all about triage centers, it was all about emergency stuff that became so visible and so present on 9-11 that I freaked out and cancelled the show. It was very interesting to see how a show that was even more imbibed in life became imbibed in tragic events of life. And it was therefore cancelled, but then reprised years later by looking at the other side of the medal. I mean, if you think about it, emergency is reaction. Safety is pro-action, and that's what design does most of the time. I mean, I like to say that designers almost take a Hippocratic oath, like doctors. I mean, whatever they do, even when they highlight dystopian aspects of the future or of life, is always with this idea of pushing people in the right direction. So looking at safety was about looking at the glass that was half full as opposed to half empty when you talk about emergency. But it was an exhibition that once again pushed design down from the realm of art or up from the realm of decoration and prettification into real life, which is what truly matters to us here and to us everywhere. Design and the Elastic Mind happened in 2008, and that was an exhibition that enabled me to add an important piece to the puzzle that I'm telling you about, which is the puzzle, the piece about innovation. Design and the Elastic Mind was about design and science, and it was truly an experiment. I mean, until two days, maybe one day, before the opening of the show, I could not sleep at night because I thought it would be a total flop because it was about designers and scientists thrown together and the idea that if technology had always been this membrane that sat in between designers and scientists, instead that membrane was not necessary anymore. So I thought it would be just a floppy experiment. And instead, well, you know, the truth is people are very generous and audiences are generous, so they filled in the gaps that were missing, and the exhibition became not only a big success, but also a great learning experience for me. But what was important about Design and the Elastic Mind was that um, it helped me position designers in a way that I think I will use even more in the future. Uh, designers, in reality, are the catalysts of progress. I mean, we heard a lot too much about innovation, and we know about disruptive innovation. Of course, disruptive innovation is when something is too new and you don't know how to deal with it yet, and it makes you anguished and it at least uneasy or at least feeling a malaise. What designers do is they take revolutions that happen maybe in science, in technology, or in politics, and they transform them into objects that you and I can use. 
that you and I can feel some familiarity or at least some curiosity about so we can be drawn in and we can start a new life and a new behavior with them. And this idea of designers as the uh, interface, truly, of progress between progress and humanity is what I try to stay with even today with this new show, Talk to Me, and with whatever I research, I enterprise. So, I would like now to tell you a little bit about Talk to Me, which is the exhibition that, as Christina said, is open right now, which is undertitled Design and the Communication Between People and Objects. Now, it's really great because the three currents in this exhibition, in this particular conference, kind of follow a little bit Design and the Elastic Mind and Talk to Me. I mean, if, if you think about it, who's next? I'm going to say what's next and who's next in a way come together. And then we're going to talk about creation and design is definitely about creation. <coughs> and then man and machine. And in truth, this is a little bit what Talk to me is about. It's not only about man and machine, it's about humans and objects in general. I mean, if you think about it, things have always spoken to us throughout the centuries. I mean, literature is chock -a full of pregnant objects that became catalysts for so much memory and understanding from the Madeleine uh, to my personal inspiration, which is a pretty bad poem by Guido Gozzano. Guido Gozzano is a B or C class poet from the beginning of the 20th century in Italy, and this is kind of, a, kind of a clumsy poem, but I loved it so much for some weird reason. It's called Grandma Hopes, Grandma Speranza's Friend, and at some point it talks about the little things of awful taste that Grandma Speranza had in her room. And it goes through all these different objects that are all like, you know, I just found my Pippi Longstocking doll from when I was five, and I was like, yeah, what's this? But so these things that are nothing special, taken as absolutes, but that relatively to you are incredibly meaningful. So it's something that is as old as mankind. But what I particularly like are design feats that marry very ancient human rituals and behaviors with the most advanced technology. And that's in a way what this exhibition is about. It's about how design is helping us keep our humanity with any kind of technology that is available to us. So it's a very optimistic show in a way, or at least it tries to highlight good examples. I mean, we all work in this particular field, so we know how much crap is around, but that's always the case, right? And our job is to kind of sift through the crap, our job as curators, to sift through the crap or the white noise or the fertile uh, humus that will help things blossom in the future and present the best case studies to the world. The exhibition is organized by, of course, who's talking to you, you know, and objects are the first examples. You go by scale a little bit. And this particular object is by Casey Kinzer. I'll tell you pretty much where people come from, so you'll keep that in mind. Student at NYU, the interactive telecommunications program. She's out of Kansas. And uh, she designed this little robot that is very simple. I mean, it's a robot because it moves, but it's made of cardboard. It has a smiley face, and it has a little engine and wheels and a flag that says, please help me cross, say, Washington Square. And Casey hid a camera in her bag and saw what people were doing. And you should see, well, New Yorkers, when they see something small and looking for directions, they go crazy. I mean, we know that. <laughs> but this particular, this particular robot, which is now also doing missions across MoMA, going from the lobby up to the galleries, is really, I mean, cuddled and really treated by human beings as, uh, as if it were like a very fragile little pet. And it's interesting because it takes into account so many different theories from the uncanny valley to everything else, but the truth is that we, uh, we have an instinctive relationship with objects. And the fact that objects have talked to us for centuries is made even more explicit and clear by technology today, or lack thereof. Another example case study, a dowsing rod, you know, for centuries it existed, but today, instead of looking for water, it looks for Wi-Fi. 
And this quite gorgeous example by James Chambers, and this is from the Royal College of Art in London, one of my favorite schools, which is the uh, Design Interactions program. It's a fantastic, fantastic program. Uh, James Chambers created a fictional, uh, fictional design research group called the Attenborough Design Group, and of course it's named after Sir Richard, you know, the great um, anthropologist, zoologist, biologist, intellectual, you name it. And it's a group that studies what objects would do if they were given animal instincts. So you see here, let me use the laser because I have it, yeah. You see here a little computer that raises itself on its feet if you spill coffee on the desk. And here you see a radio that sneezes, a transistor radio that sneezes to free itself from dust. And the, um, this particular school, the Royal College of Art, attracts people from all over the world and it's become one of the most important places for, the, uh, for the, the, the shape that design will take in the future, this particular program, and I'll talk about it a little more later. I'm talking to you is where people communicate with each other by means of objects and by means of technology, so it's the place for social networks too. But there's not too much about social networks in the exhibition. Social networks are taken as subjects, not as, uh, as actors in the design progress, because let's face it, the design quotient of social networks is pretty grim right now. Let's hope it gets better. But there are so many different examples of great objects that are used to make people communicate. And of course, I think that most of you are already familiar with the iWriter project. I always hail it as a great example because the iWriter project shows what great talent, great generosity, a good use of open source morale and, uh, and philosophy can do for the world. Right now, they can do it for one paralyzed graffiti artist, but they can really move on to spread across the world. Uh, just a little uh, introduction about the iWriter project. It's a group of hackers that is, you know, Zach Lieberman, James Powderly, I mean, many different people, Ivan Roth, many of you might know some of them, that most of them come out of the iBeam, which is another interesting atelier uh, workshop in New York. And they um, helped graffiti artist Tempt One in Los Angeles, who was completely paralyzed because of Lou Gehrig disease tag again a building in downtown LA by using a technology that they developed a few years ago, which is the laser tag technology, which enables you to tag buildings and, and other uh, landmarks with laser. It's a temporary tag, but it still has the kind of guerrilla feeling, so every time they show up anywhere, the police come, even though there's nothing invasive about the, the whole technology. But so, by using very simple eyeglasses, a computer camera, the software they developed, um, Tempt One was able from his bed in the hospital using his pupils to tag a building in downtown LA and see it on the screen in real time with an emotion that we can only imagine because he could not express it except for ra very rapid eye movements. But this particular project really cuts down to the heart of the issue. And you have to remember, my audience at MoMA is of course made of people like you. I always feel that I have to give something to the community that has given me so much. But it's also made of a really, really wide audience that comes to MoMA to see Matisse and Picasso, to, see the, to take the vitamins of art, and then they stumble upon a design show and I want to keep them there. And of course, the most receptive part of my audience are kids, and they immediately get it. But in some cases, um, universal messages like this are extremely powerful for the wide audience. Um, an example that is facetious but at the same time very serious is E. Chromai by Daisy Ginsburg and James King, um, also RCA, also design interactions but now everywhere. And Daisy in particular has set up um, a whole movement, a whole consortium of universities across the world that work on the field of synthetic biology coupled with design. As a matter of fact, this ichromai is an example of designers working with synthetic biologists by tweaking bacteria, in this case it's the very common E. coli that we all carry in our guts, they get tweaked, engineered and uh, redesigned so that they react to different chemicals in our guts that correspond to different pathologies and therefore taken as a shake, they become diagnostic tools in our guts and they actually give out their signals through our stool. So our poo becomes the diagnostic tool. 
And, you know, this particular project won the iGEM, you know, the jamboree that is MIT, at MIT every year that is about genetically engineered machinery. And, uh, and, of course, it's quite beautiful in the exhibition. It's shown in this perfect briefcase with all the different samples of stools that, of course, are not real. But, you know, it gives you another example of what designers can do, and it's very far from cute chairs, as you can imagine. Um, social interaction, there are various examples of actually physical world interaction with technology that enables you to actually overcome some of your, uh, of course, problems. You know, everybody has a problem with his or her own body, and Adi Maram is very small, so she created these extensible platforms that are, uh, that are actually um, commanded by an app on her iPhone. And of course, there were, were a few games, a few social games like Tentacles. I don't know how many of you have, have played this game, uh, but the video game field presents so many great examples of real art and great design, and this was a particularly uh, effective one. Life talks to you, so does your family, so does your home. So there's a very lively communication going on with your own life. It's biometrics, it's about recording everything that you do. And Nicholas Felton is uh, a very famous example. Nicholas Felton puts out every year the Feltron report. He added an R to his last name because it sounds much more corporate and kind of, you know, a little bit off, you know, a little spy, a little spooks-like. And he records everything that he does, you know, where he eats, how many times he has sex, what he drinks, etc., etc. And every year he puts out an annual report that is at the same time mocking but also beautifying the whole idea. And it's quite beautiful. Life talking to you is, of course, represented also by Passage. Um, many of you might know this game by Jason Rohrer. I love it. And it's in the exhibition and people can play it. It's a game where you go in five minutes from birth to death. You go through life. You see over there, you have your little grave, you know, over there. And you have choices, right? You can decide whether to take a partner or not. If you take a partner, life is easier, but it ends sooner. If you don't take a partner, you live longer, but it's a little tougher. You have obstacles and choices to make, and so on and so forth. So it's a very philosophical game, and one that definitely makes you think more than one would uh, hope to. And uh, PIG05049 is also a great example of an incredibly thoughtful project that marries really old technology with new ideas about the afterlife of people and of animals. Pig 05049 is the name of a pig that designer Christian Meindertsma uh, chose in a factory in an industrial farm in, in the Netherlands. And after it was slaughtered, she followed the pig everywhere to find out all the products that were made out of that pig, and you realize how impossible it is truly to keep kosher or halal in the world, because pieces of pigs are everywhere, from Crayola crayons to the glaze of ceramics to even cigarettes, because the hemoglobin of the pig is used in the filter, so there's like fragments of this pig everywhere. And it's really interesting, because all of a sudden you realize so much more about the world by looking at just one particular individual object. One part of the exhibition that I'm really proud of is the part that enables you to talk with God. So it's about technology helping you talk with God, Halla, or whichever, uh, yeah, ja, ja, Rastafari, I mean, whichever you decide to talk with. This is an object that is actually used by uh, cloister nuns in northern England, uh, and it's uh, a ticker tape that draws from Google News and from We Feel Fine. I don't know if you know the Jonathan Harris and Seb Kamvar website that is really about taking very intimate uh, iterations of the root feel on the internet. So you have both the macro, Google News, and the micro, and we feel fine, and it gives these nuns some topics to pray about. Because, you know, they're quite isolated, they're really isolated, they on, only get Vatican newspapers, and we know how they don't have really news. So by using this ticker tape, they can pray for, you know, little Brigitte in, uh, in Hamburg, who's down one day because it rains, or they can pray that Gaddafi does not hurt anybody else and leaves without creating too much trouble. So the same happens also in other religions, and this, uh, is, this is a great example for Muslims. It's a, prayer, it's, it's a prayer mat that lights up. It has a compass module, so it lights up when you're really in the direction of Mecca just in case you're a little disorientated. And it was created by Soner Ozenk, who is a designer, a Turkish designer living in London. 
the city, of course, talks to you. This is probably one of the examples of interaction fields that are most explored, and I'm sure that many of you here uh, work in it a lot. And the uh, design response is at all different scales. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Poke. It's a company in London, and Baker Tweet is a Twitter device that is set at the Albion Bakery in East London. It's kind of sturdy because it has to be uh, handled by you know bakers when they might have flour on their hands and so on and so forth. But basically, it sends its its subscribers tweets that let it be known that the croissants are coming out of the oven. Now, if you think about it, I mean, it's what I used to do. You know, we, we used to go uh, out until the wee hours at four in the morning, and then we would go sniffing around Milan to find out which bakery was having bread delivered. You know, and right now you can get a tweet, which is much easier. Then we get to the scale of the building, and this is an example of a building that is a QR tag. You know, the big facade is a QR tag. Now, I think the QR tags will become nostalgia in about two years. You know, when GPS technology will be finer and when we'll be able to have shape recognition that is also finer. We will not need them anymore. But right now, they are used a lot. And also in the exhibition, they're used. I'll show you how. But this particular building delivers messages that are it's in a shopping district, so it's about uh, sales and particular events that are happening inside. The exhibition shows also very low-tech, maybe enabled by new technology, but still very old-fashioned. And this is a map of Berlin created by artist Cecil Tolas, who used headspace technology. Headspace technology is used in the perfume industry. It was developed in the 60s to capture the scent of uh, a live flower without without killing it. It almost looks like old acupuncture, Chinese acupuncture cuppings, and it really captures the aroma without killing whatever is in front of it. And Cecil used it for Berlin, and she created a whole map with West, South, Berlin, and so on and so forth. And in the exhibition, we have this sense that, you know, I mean, they're not Gardenia, but they're not even Chinatown in New York in the summer, so not so bad. I mean, really, I'm sure that those of you who are from Berlin would get a real jolt out of recognizing that particular uh, scent. Locals and Tourists uh, is um, a series of maps from all over the world. There's about 125 cities where, the, by drawing uh, pictures from Picasso and Flickr, the designer was able to detect which zones are more for tourists and which zones are more for locals. Of course, the locals are the ones that will take pictures more all over the city and through a longer period of, over a longer period of time. So it kind of gives you a snapshot of where you want to go if you're a local and when, where tourists usually go. It's one more way to read the city. Then there are worlds that talk to you and that you talk and converse with, and worlds that come in many different flavors. I mean, this is a quite beautiful project by Chris Wolpkin and Kenichi Okada. It's called Animal Superpowers. It was developed between Tokyo and London and New York, and it's a series of objects that enable children to feel like an ant. So what, you see that red helmet? It has a camera inside. No, the camera is in the, is in the gloves, and you have a screen in front of you, and the gloves magnify objects 10 times, you know, so you see the grass really big, and instead the yellow one is to make you feel like a giraffe, of course, you know, you're not, it does, it's like a periscope. You don't get to be a giraffe, but you feel a little bit like it. And then instead, another way to look to the world is much more serious and much more um, about real life. Once again, it's BBC Dimensions that was developed by Berg London. BBC Dimensions is one of my favorite projects in the show. I actually like them all, but this one enables you to take events that happened elsewhere in the world, like the oil spill in the Gulf or other, you know, the floods in Afghanistan and superimpose them onto your home turf. So all of a sudden you realize how big something really was because you can feel it in your gut. And you realize that the, the walk on the Apollo, the Apollo 11 moon landing was a walk around the block. It was pretty ridiculous, frankly. But, you know, it's, it's interesting. And instead you realize that the floods were in the Gulf spill was so big. I find it amazing when we use technology to really get a stronger sense of reality. You know, it's a very good use. So what you've seen so far is really an expression of that. And other objects in the show, other examples in the show range from Ushahidi, which is the service that enables citizen journalists to actually map in real time with any kind of telecommunication areas of danger. There are many other um, examples that are about reality. Because, you know, it's also very important in an exhibition to give um, something, um, something sweet and light and then something very deep and serious at the same time. So people have this modulation that lets them 
them really perceive things at a deeper level. They Rule by Josh Ahn is a website that, in my opinion, was one of the first truly political users of the internet ever. It was in 2004, and it hasn't really been updated, I mean, yes, but not so effectively ever since. But it showed all the collusions and the connections between corporate boards and governmental organizations in the United States in 2004. It was quite amazing to see how the connection between politicians and corporations went well beyond lobbying and was truly, uh, you know, incestuous in a way. And it had never been used that way before. So visualization design has become, of course, uh, a very important political tool, but it also has become more and more refined. And you know, also these exhibitions enable one to go through many different forms of design. Let's remember, it's still our world, and QR tags are lovely, uh, and they can also be perceived as land art, like old Aztec or runes from, uh, from Celtic regions. And this is actually a QR tag that is mown in a lawn in Turingia. <laughs> which I find really quite beautiful. Of course, any time you do a show and you categorize things, you always end up uh, having a miscellaneous category. I mean, you always end up with things that don't fit anywhere. But when I started doing this particular exhibition and realized that there were so many things that didn't fit, I realized that I missed a category for real, which is the double entendre category. I mean, whenever there's communication, there is miscommunication, there is like mistakes, but these mistakes can become actually very good pretexts for a new form of understanding. And in particular, I realized that one of the most important pools in our lives today is curiosity towards others, you know, the people that we considered others of any kind, whether it's gender, whether it's age, whether it's skin, whether it's way of life, where it's, we know, whether it's sexual orientation. And so many people in the world of design and art and technology are working towards understanding others. I find that one of the most moving part of the exhibition and of what I've found in the, in the whole world of design. This is Sputniko. I love Sputniko. She's Japanese. In Japan, she's a pop star. And in England, instead, she's a designer. So it was very funny because uh, she was followed by Vogue Japan when she came to the opening of the show. And it's her here in the show next to her objects. And uh, the, the people from Vogue Japan were saying, is she a designer? I'm like, yeah, she is. But what she does is she does really far-fetched and very strong objects that are usually accompanied by artwork and also by a music video. So it's like, a full-fledged 360-degree expression of what she means. And she needs that because she has pretty important concepts to communicate. One of my favorite pieces in the show is the, her menstruation machine. You can see it really small here. It's fabulous. It almost like, looks like a chastity belt, and it enables people that cannot have their period to feel what it means to really have it. So it's for men, children. It has electrodes that make you have cramps. Then it has a reservoir with something that comes under here, and you're supposed to take your blood, fill the reservoir, and then, you know, you wear your sanitary pad and everything else. And I find it, it's, it's been very polarizing. I mean, some people have gotten really offended by it in New York, and some others instead, myself included, find it one of the most poetic uh, gestures ever, because, you know, wouldn't it be fantastic if there were stations, menstruation machine stations, so a man for once in his lifetime can go and really feel it? You know, I think it's one of the most beautiful actions that there can be for a real understanding of otherness, because it's one of the last taboos. So I really, really love that particular piece. I mean, what I was showing here was her crowbot, Jenny, because I realized that I didn't bring with me the menstruation machine um, image, but you might want to go and look for it, because it's quite beautiful. And there's also a little video in which Takashi, Takashi is a guy, of course, but you cannot really tell it's a guy. He goes and struts around town with his girlfriend wearing it, and it's like a really nice pop song. <laughs> It says, you know, does it hurt, huh? It hurts, and it's going to hurt more. <laughs> so this is, a, a, you know, understanding others, and you know, also kind of repulsive animals, or considered by most repulsive animals. This is the work by Chris Wopkin and Natalie Jeremijenko, a bat billboard that is supposed to make people in New York understand that bats are good. So it's a big billboard that works as habitat for the bats. You know, they can all, like, hang upside down behind it. But also by working with bat experts that think they can understand a little bit about the, the sounds that 
bats make, it also kind of broadcasts what they're doing during the day. You know, sometimes in whimsical ways, like, hmm, I really like her ears, and other times, like, we're taking off for a snack, we're going to sleep. So it's this idea of using technology to highlight things that we didn't know before, different worlds, and to understand others also when they are animals. Now, mind you, every single project that you've seen here is usually coming from a team of experts. So the menstruation machine was done together with a doctor. Crowbot Jenny, the other project by Sputniko, with Crow experts. And in the case of Natalie and Chris, they really worked with scientists as well. So what I like particularly about what designers do today is that they are always well-rounded and ready to answer any questions. And I think that's very important, and that's what differentiates them from artists sometimes. Artists have a lot of artistic license that supports them and floats them, and instead designers need to be really ready to justify whatever they do. A Rubik's Cube for the Blind, very simply, taking the name of the color and putting them in braille so even blind people can play with it. A lot of um, objects for disabled people are part of this double entendre section because that's also one of the last barriers. So it's about breaking barriers. And in this particular case, the subject that I love so much is a typographic book in which hyperlinks are represented as real red threads, a reminder of what things truly are and uh, also these beautiful transformers that are kanji characters that correspond to animals' name that transform into the animal shape. So this idea of bringing together the physical, the virtual, and understanding and transforming and translating and being liquid, which is what Amber um, also speaks about. I mean, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but I always like that kind of mutant liquid Terminator 2 feeling of being able to actually make yourself really small so that you can enter another dimension is what the whole exhibition is about. And it's also about communication. So since the very beginning, we were keeping a blog in which we showed, when I say very beginning, I'm talking about a year and a half ago, uh, we showed what we were looking at. I mean, everything that we were looking at was listed in the queue, and we showed our tribulations as curators, you know, like, oh, this taxonomy doesn't work, we have to change it, we have to change it for this reason. Then we were showing ideas about the installation, you know, the problem, the big challenge with a show like this is how do you house 80 screens of different sizes and not make it look like a trade fair or a, a, a game arcade. And at the beginning we were looking at you know, Soviet bus stops made of concrete, and we were looking at mini golfs, and then in the end we ended up with a different idea. Um, the graphics of the exhibition, this old-fashioned idea of pixelation, why, even if it's old-fashioned? Well, because it's one of the first and more playful way to make the wide audience think of technology, of digital technology. You know, so you always have to, um, to play on the edge of being scholarly and really talking about the subject in depth, and also finding ways that are almost infotainment and edutainment ways to deliver your message. Because if you remain too cryptic or too serious, you're not going to get there. Um, and in the exhibition, as I mentioned to you, we used QR tags a lot and also in the catalog. In the catalog, the QR tags link you directly to the video, so they don't go to a website. They go straight to the video, which is housed in the website. And instead, in the exhibition, they are there as bookmarks, so they take you to the website. Um, you can bookmark objects to see later if the exhibition is too crowded. You can actually shoot the bookmark and bring it with you. So there's a, a good um, use of QR tags, not because we wanted to uh, aestheticize them, but just because that's what's available right now. And uh, a good use of the uh, blog to divulge what we were doing, but also to keep us on our on our feet. So there was a lot of crowdsourcing. I mean, Juan later on will talk about, um, he was talking yesterday about, what do you call it, social curation? And I'm like, yeah, I don't believe in that. You know, so there's a, it's very interesting, but I certainly do believe in feedback and in keeping it open and getting uh, a better understanding of how different people feel about things. And this brings us to the idea of geography that I think is so important. In this exhibition and in Design and the Elastic Mind, the nations were Represented. I mean, I never counted them, but they um, really comprised so much of the globe. Not enough, but a lot, certainly. And I feel that even more so in the future, we will see design and art and technology spreading everywhere. What I think is important is to 
keep the idea of the validity of centers of gravity well in mind. Quality is what will lead us in the future. I mean, so many people think there's an overwhelming amount of examples, and it's true, but at the same time, there's also a natural selection of the species that happens and that is guided by quality, of course, and also by need. And only by understanding needs of other nations and needs of other markets, you know, some people call them markets, other people call them instead audiences, only by understanding needs from elsewhere will we be able to really keep up and do our job, which is to push things slightly further. And to, once again, as designers, I consider you all designers, be able to be the interface between real progress and the need to be very full and very generous as human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, Thank very you. interesting. Mm. Thank you. Oh, what a wonderful introduction and, and in-depth uh, presentation of, of what, what design can be. Uh, probably most of you here know more about this than I do, but I must say, for me, it was an eye-opener. Um, we're almost ready for, for questions and answers from the audience, but I'm going to take the opportunity and start. I just want to make sure that there are microphones out there um, so that, you know, I'll ask a question or two, and then it will be your turn. No, I was just, I, I wanted to ask you because you were talking about who's next and you mentioned that there are people from all over the world, but is there any particular area of the world where you see that things are happening a lot, where you, that you find particularly interesting? Mm -hmm. Well, who's next is everybody and uh, that's what I'm always trying to make people understand in the States. I feel that Americans still have a strange complex of inferiority towards Europe when it comes to uh, design and to, because they think it's style and they think it's, it's aesthetics, so they still think that it's not for them. But number one, it is for them because design is for the people. And number two, the complex of inferiority should not really be towards Europe, but it should be more towards the BRIC countries maybe, which are the ones that in my opinion are best equipped to deal with the needs for sustainability of the future. But this is a, a big discussion about what's the next audience. In terms of who's next as designers, um, once again, I feel that while once upon a time design was where the industry was, now it's where the thought is. And the thought is most of the times in schools or labs or workshops where people still have, find a very fertile environment to develop new ideas. Interestingly, in my opinion, the best schools for the kind of integrated design for the liminal space, so design that gives you a training that gives you also physical and virtual um, education, tend to be the RCA, you know, absolutely, uh, the RCA in London, uh, maybe the Eindhoven Academy of Art and Design, really good. In Oslo, there's a great interaction design department. Um, and um, uh, in Lausanne, in Switzerland, there's an interesting school, maybe too, too connected to luxury, but and typeface and, type, and, you know, and typography. Um, and then there are schools, you know, the Media Lab model, which was really strong in the past, and then it had a lull, and it might now have a resurgence because there's a new president that is very promising. It has sparked different embryonic examples, like KAIST in Korea, the Korean Advanced Institute for Science and Technology. So there are many um, different projects like this. Interestingly, the potential is enormous, but I see, for instance, in RISD, John Maida is the new president there. I, th I find that the most interesting schools are the ones that are able to marry a sense of anthropology and material culture with new technology and a reminder of the centrality of human beings, together with the capability of creating networks, interdisciplinary networks. So, um, in a way, they're the more liquid ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, anybody has a question out there? I would just like you to raise your hand, stand up, say who you are and what your organization is, and keep the question fairly quick so that the answer can be nice and meaty. Now. Hi. Uh, Hello. This is a fantastic talk. Uh, uh, Doug Siri 
from the MIT Press. Um, so you're, you're, you're a senior curator at the Museum of Modern Art. You're not a senior curator at the Museum of Modern Design. Mm -hmm. What is the difference in your mind between design and art today? I talked with, I was at a meeting with Tony Dunn and Fiona Baby from the RCA just recently, and they, they, they will not call their work art. No. It's design in their mind. Natalie Jeremajenko, who has a PhD in engineering, calls her work art. Mm -hmm. um, Carl DeSalvo, critical design, art. Um, uh, any number of people. What, in your mind, in the 21st century, what is the difference between design and art? Thank I think you. it's more militancy. In a way, the difference between design and art cannot be told by what you, are, what you have in front of you, because many designers use video or they use concept. And uh, many artists really look to design to keep themselves grounded. When I was teaching at UCLA many years ago, I was teaching a course open to everybody, I used to say that the only difference between an artist and a designer is that an artist can choose whether to be responsible towards other people, the Hippocratic Oath, or not. And instead, a designer had to be by definition. But truly, um, I think that the issue is a little bit of a chip on the shoulder. I mean, art is recognized by everybody in culture as important, and design instead is always lower on the rungs. If you think about it, all the so-called established media in the United States have critics for architecture, for art, three or four for theater, dance, you know, and nobody for design. Now, how many people are touched by dance and how many people are touched by design? I'm not saying that dance is not important, but the only bona fide international design critic is Alice Ross on the Herald Tribune, and the Herald Tribune belongs to the New York Times, but they don't use her in the print section, you know, in the art section. She's only on the website. So I think that people like Fiona and Tony are really militant. Not only that, but also they want to stress the utility in the long run of what they do. I mean, if you look at the work of Dan and Raby, sometimes it looks like artwork, performance pieces, and you're like, so what's the deal here? Like, they did a wonderful piece that we're now acquiring into the MoMA collection that's called Foragers, in which they created a whole video and all the props that go with them to show that in the future, in order to deal with a shortage of food, we might need to outsource our gastrointestinal system, literally, so create this kind of prosthesis that <laughs> enable us to digest algae and so on and so forth. Fantastic. What is the difference between that and the Matthew Barney piece? You know, I mean, formally, almost nothing. But in truth, they position themselves in this particular current. What they're doing is for the uh, future of mankind and of technology. And sometimes companies hire there to be their official thorns in the side. You know, by the way, Tony Dunn is the director of that Design Interactions program, so they're my idols, you know. Um, and I think that that's the reason. You know, sometimes you ideologically position yourself as designer because you want to improve the lot and you want to improve the destinies of design in the world, or other times you want to stress your generosity, your altruism, and the fact that you are extroverted as opposed to introverted. But truly, especially in this world, the only difference is intentions and the market, because of course the art market has its own vagaries that I hope designers will stay away from, even though it's becoming difficult. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. More questions? So it's easy for you out there to see. Any raised hands? There's one There's over one. here. Wait, you're, gonna, you're getting the microphone coming. Hi, Paula. Um, Hi. I'm Rahul. Um, uh, work at Ergonomy Design. I have a very short question. I just want to know how you discover such amazing talent. Mm -hmm. how, how do you, I mean, apart from the internet, of course, how mm -hmm. do, do you travel the world and find out these uh, amazing works, or how do they mm -hmm. come to you? Ergonomy Design, by the way, is a really great design group that's existed for many years, and it's a staple of the MoMA collection that's all about ergonomic design and extended usership. Um, well, I, uh, how do I find all these things? I crowdsource a lot. Now, the, the blog was a way, I mean, the first thing that I did even in 95 to do a show was to ask everybody I knew. So um, it's very important to always be receptive. I travel, I'm here, and I'm going to look at the whole conference. I'm not going to leave after my speech, so that's where I'm going to find some. I go to school shows. If what I don't, don't see in person, I see online. I follow certain t Twitter people. I mean, I, I do what we all do and I try to sift through. I'm pretty good at synthesizing and sifting through. I think that's my gift, and that's also why I'm in contemporary design and not in historical design. I go 
So, so certain people can do it fast and other people don't. But it's about really having a good network and being um, online and on the road a lot. We have time for one more question. Don't miss the opportunity. <laughs> There's one over there. Hi, Hampus Jacobson, RIM TAT. Um, not everybody has the opportunity to go to MoMA all the time. So have, what ways have you made it possible for people to enjoy uh, sort of your creation and sort of the great shows? Oh, thank virtually? you for reminding me to, to say that. And thank you for the opportunity. No, no, it's good because I, I was not doing the usual. I, I'm supposed to plug these things, so thank you very much. Now, we have a great, 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 great website by Stamen. You know, Stamen is the company in San Francisco. So it, it's a great website, not only because it looks good, but also because it's Twitter-based, so every object has a different page, and all the Twitters are there, and every object in the show has a different hashtag, so people are, in, are encouraged to actually tweet about the, in, the individual objects. So there's the website, which has even more than the objects in the show. And I've always done a website for every show because I think it's something that remains. Like even the one in 95, they gave me a budget of $320 because they didn't know what a website was. So I learned HTML and I did it by myself and it's horrible. It's still on the MoMA website if you want to see it. Mutant materials, marbleized background, really horrible. Um, but ever since, you know, we've done a website for every single exhibition that is never um, a rehashing of the, sh of the show. It's an object, a work of design onto its own. Then um, we will also do virtual tours, you know, um, live tours, live streaming tours at some point, I think in September or in October. So it has a very good life online. Um, it's never like going um, physically to something, but you know what? I've also learned to kind of integrate. We're very, the plasticity of our brain, and I'm using here plasticity in a way that is not scientifically correct, but the way we're able to fill in the lack of physical presence with the um, imagination of the space and the understanding of the objects, I think is really good. What happens when you're not there in reality is that I think the attention span is different. Like um, being in a space. I feel still works at a deeper level in terms of memorizing and in terms of learning than seeing things online. But otherwise, there's a lot of surrogates that you can find uh, from the catalog to the website to the Twitter flow. Um, Talk to me 2011 is how our handle on Twitter. And so there's a lot. Thank you, Thank you. so much. Thanks Paula. a lot. I think another huge applause. Thank you very, very much.